Assalamu alaikum and good evening to you all. Welcome to the master class on OSPI for MBBS final year student episode 4 organized by SCP Bangladesh chapter and supported by Bangladesh Society of Medicine. As you already know, it is a program which is designed for the medicine OSPI of final professional MBBS examination. Today's topic is the most aortic topic of all time and we have received so many requests about this topic. Yes, today's class will held on echocardiography or shortly called ECG. To teach us about ECG, we have a legendary professor here with us. He is none other than Professor Titu Miyasar. He is the principal and professor of medicine, Thaka Medical College. He is also the former Secretary General of Bangladesh Society of Medicine. Today's program will be chaired by one of the best physicians of our time, our very own Governor of ACP Bangladesh Chapter, Professor H. A. M. Najmul Hassan Sir. He was also a former President of Bangladesh Society of Medicine. As a panelist, we have another renowned Professor of Medicine, Professor Hafiz Sheikhdar Sir. He is the professor of medicine, Dhaka Medical College. As a moderator with us, we have the young, the talented and beautiful Dr. Madhubi Kormakar Madam. She is the consultant of nephrology, Dhaka Medical College and she is also the member secretary of SAP Bangladesh chapter. During the live session, you can ask topic related question on the co comment section of the live stream. We shall try to answer them in the question and answer session, which will start right after the presentation. So, without doing any further delay, let me hand over the session to Dr. Madhubi Karmakar Madam. Dr. Madhubi Karmakar Madam. Thank you, Dr. Prince, for your nice introduction. Honorable Chairperson and Panelist, respected speaker and learned audience, good evening. Welcome you all to our today's master class on OSPI. Uh, for, it is arranged for final year previous students organized by ACP Bangladesh chapter and supported by Bangladesh Society of Medicine. Our today's topic of discussion is electrocardiogram or ECG. ECG is an important diagnostic test and a very common investigation that gives various information about heart. Interpretation of ECG is a must for every physician. That's why it is an integral part of OSPI. And for next an hour, we will go through this important topic, which will be discussed by a renowned physician and a great teacher, master on this topic, Professor Dr. Mohammed Titu Miyasar, who is now working as a professor of medicine and principal Taka Medical College. We also, uh, we are lucky that we have another renowned physician and a very dedicated teacher, Professor Happy Shorter Sir, as a panelist with us. He is the Professor of Medicine and Head, Department of Medicine, Taka Medical College. And our today's session will be chaired by one of the most respected teachers and a famous physician, Professor A.N. Nasmul Ahsan Sir, who is a dream maker of this health talk session and the current governor of the Bangladesh chapter. So, no more delay. With the permission of the chair, may I now request Professor Tito Miyasar to start his lecture. <coughs> Professor Tito Miyasar. Uh, thank you, Madhubi. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Madhubi? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my my uh, heartfelt thanks and gratitude uh, to the organizer and special thanks to the to today's uh, chairperson, sir, who is the current government of uh, governor of uh, SCP chapter Bangladesh and also uh, the today's uh, other panelists uh, my colleague and uh, my head of the department Thaka Medical College uh, medicine department uh, professor Hafiz Shadda and also um, I have uh, found uh, and I have listened uh, the and I have seen the presence of my mentor my teacher and uh, who was the ex-principal and uh, head of medicine in Dhaka Medical College, Professor Khan Abul Kalam Ajas, sir. And also the other participants and uh, the panelists and uh, Dr. Prince, uh, who are also in the part of the organize, organizing this class. Uh, and i like to thank again for choosing me as a speaker in this uh, very common topic, 
Madhavi has already mentioned, which is a very common topic in uh, final prop exam. And everybody should know about uh, the ECG, few basic things about ECG. And uh, we know the in the final prop exam, uh, well, examiners usually enter through the ECG into certain topics, especially the cardiovascular system and some rela uh, related topics. So this is a essential part of exam and especially in the OSP or in the nowadays uh, in the near future, it will be included in the Viva table also. So uh, uh, we should, uh, we are going to uh, give some highlights to the student uh, so that they will be benefited from our uh, discussion. So we all know the, uh, the conduction system uh, of the heart. Uh, this is started from the SA node, uh, then it goes through the atrium and reaches to the AV node and then bundle of his and to the uh, left bundle, right bundle and Parkinson fibers. And these are the, uh, what we record in the chest wall, uh, the electrical activity of the heart. And this is, uh, we. This is what we found as the uh, ECG tracing. <clears throat> we know that our leads are 12 leads ECG. Uh, there are three limb leads and the unipolar limb leads also another three. And six chest leads, B1 to B6. So uh, these are the locations, uh, especially the uh, chest leads. Uh, start in the right parasternal region in the fourth intercostal space, B1, B2 in the fourth intercostal left parasternal border, and B4 in the fifth intercostal space, and B3 is in between. And uh, then in the B5 uh, in the left fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line, and also the B6 in the left fifth on the mid axillary line. So uh, this is also important just to uh, have an idea how the leads help in localization, anatomical location of the involvement of the heart. Uh, if we find something, some changes, or the uh, these leads represent the uh, following areas. Uh, I mean, the one and AVL and B5 to B6 means the lateral or anterolateral aspect of the heart. And always the lead two, three, and AVF uh, signifies the inferior aspect of the heart. So when we want to see any pathology, uh, in we should look into the in the inferior aspect of the heart, inferior surface of the heart. Then we should search in the lead two, three, and AVF. Similarly, B one and B two reflects the right ventricle, and B three, B four, interventricular septum. So any uh, thing uh, happens in the changes in the V3 and V4, it means the interventricular septal uh, involvement. And V5 and V6, the typically the, uh, the left ventricle uh, denotes the left ventricle. And V1 to V6 means the whole anterior aspect of the heart. And when it uh, add, we add with the one and AVL, and then V1 to V6 means the lateral part and also the anterior part means the extensive anterior aspect of the heart or it is called the anterior lateral and one and avl only the very high high lateral and two three avf avl b5 to b6 inferior lateral so uh, by looking at these uh, changes we can locate the anatomical aspects and if we locate the anatomical aspect anatomical area then we can also can assess sometimes the which artery territory or which artery of the coronary artery is involved we can sometimes locate even without going for the angiogram and ct angiogram or coronary angiogram just looking at the ecg we can assess so this is a typical uh, uh, this is the paper ecg paper the most smallest uh, square is 0 0.04 uh, second and when these two uh, five uh, smaller square is within one big square, this is uh, 0 0.04 into five means the 0.2 seconds. So this is will, uh, this will help us to uh, assess the uh, size of different OFs, to assess the rate of the heart rate, and uh, also to assess the voltage and other things uh, of ECG. 
So we all know uh, the, about the uh, OEPs. This is the POF and QRS and the POF. And EOF is not usually visible. And uh, the PR interval, uh, we can see from the pictures uh, which part. And the ST segment also uh, means the uh, starting of, uh, I mean, the ending of the S and beginning of the T is the ST segment. So these are the uh, complexes, QRS complex, P, Q, R, S, T, means the whole ECG complex. I mean, the, uh, the main part, the QRS complex denotes the ventricular uh, complex. So I have mentioned about the small square, and uh, sometimes the speed, uh, the more the speed, the more the gap between the R, R two R O A B is more. So uh, the length and uh, duration, uh, uh, the typical, uh, the which we should know is the PR interval, the starting of the P and beginning of the R O A B is that this is called the PR interval. And this PR interval uh, uh, is the uh, time limit is 0 0.1 to 2.2. So when uh, the PR interval is prolonged, it means more than two seconds. And QRS complex, when we say the wide QRS complex, it is always more than 1.2. And some uh, some other uh, uh, things, we, uh, especially we should uh, come into I mean, uh, coming to our uh, visualization is the ST segment elevations. ST segment is elevated when it is elevated from the baseline. In case of limb leads, it is one millimeter, then it is significant. And when it is two millimeter in the chest, is then it is significant. And uh, the depth of the Q wave is usually two millimeter. And when it is more than two millimeter, then the uh, it is means abnormal Q wave. Uh, regarding the uh, OF, TOF, the, in the chest lead, it should be the height of the TOF in the normal cases, it should be the less than 10 millimeter. And in case of uh, limb leads, it is less than uh, uh, 5 millimeters. Sometimes we'll find TOF is very tall, then it should be uh, more than 10 and 5 in, in uh, chest lead and limb lead respectively. So this is about the axis. I don't uh, like to, even I cannot memorize the uh, how the axis is determined. So it is very difficult uh, for the, it will be difficult for the undergrad student and it is not required in the exam. So uh, regarding uh, the rate, I have mentioned uh, the smaller square, rate means in the heart rate means the how many beats heart is, how many times is beating within one minute. So one minute in smallest square is equivalent to 0 0.04. So it is equivalent to 15 smallest square, 1500 smallest squares, and equivalent to the larger square is 300. So the uh, to find out the rate, we have to uh, uh, I mean the 1500 divided by R R interval in smallest square, or the 300 divided by R R interval is the rate. So in case of irregular rhythm, we all know the it should be uh, determined by QRS complexes in the 30 largest square into 10. So look at this ECG. Uh, this is uh, when we are going for to see the ECG, we have to look starting from the POF, then Q, then QRS complex, then uh, SOF, then ST segment, then TOF, and we should uh, find all these things sequentially so when we are we have uh, got some knowledge about the uh, qrs complex is normal appearance of the camera then we can find out the abnormal and uh, we have already uh, have got some knowledge about the what is the duration of the peer interval what is the duration of the qrs complex uh, what should be the height of the st segment and we call it abnormal what should be the height of the theory we have found so in exam, uh, I want to mean the, what is usually asked in the exam. It is very much related to the rate, rhythm, the abnormalities about the rate and rhythm, and uh, sometimes the morphological change in the QRS complex. These are the common things we used to uh, ask to the students. 
so first of all we have to find out when we are going for reading an ecg we think about the whether the rate is all right or not so we have to count the rate but uh, just i have a few seconds before i have mentioned and we should go for the rhythm also is it regular is the or irregular if it is irregular whether it is irregular irregularly irregular and whether the complexes or qrs complex are normal looking or abnormal looking this should be seen in a normal ecg if we go through this ecg we have found that uh, all the complexes are sim uh, similar and normal complex ecg complex i mean the pqrst is within normal limit rate is also we can count down uh, it is uh, less than 100 definitely and uh, larger square uh, rr interval is almost one two three four uh, so uh, it is near about 70 uh, probably and it is regular in interval so this is a normal ecg rate and rhythm is normal so what i mentioned all the waves and intervals and segments are within normal limit uh, and rhythm is regular heart rate is 70 beats per minute so diagnosis is normal ECG. So just uh, what is the uh, what we we are finding in this ECG? You see the uh, height of the complexes is very uh, low, and the rate a bit uh, more than uh, probably the if we count the rate, it is uh, more than hundred probably. Tachycardia is there. But the height of the, all the complexes are low. This is a uh, picture of the, uh, I mean, the typical low voltage ECG. Normally, one millivolt is equivalent to 10 millimeter. So uh, here, the uh, voltage criteria has been shown. The, it is all less than the normal latitude. What is the normal height? Uh, in case of limb leads, the height should be less than 5 millimeter in case of chest lead. To say the normal, uh, I mean the low voltage, and in case of chest uh, chest lead, it should be less than 10. And here we are finding almost all the all the complexes, the height of the complexes is less than five millimeters. So this is the typical appearance of a low voltage ECG. And where we found this, usually it is found in hypothyroidism. It is found in case of pericardial effusion, and it is found in very uh, thick chest wall and in case of emphysema and other things again what we are getting here uh, almost uh, the poa qrs complex is normal appearance there is no abnormality in the complexes there is no abnormality in the segments and but uh, what we are finding the RR interval is has been reduced, and it is frequently the heartbeat is probably more than uh, 100. So here we are finding just uh, tachycardia, not other than this. There is no ST elevation, there is no ST depression, there is no T wave abnormalities. If we look at the T wave in the chest, lead, say in the B4, it is always less than uh, I mean 10. And similarly, in case of uh, lead one, it is less than five. So there is, it is within normal limit. But the abnormality, what we are finding is the rate. So this is the case of sinus tachycardia. So uh, what are the commonest causes? We all know it is, it can happen in case of anxiety, emotions, exercise, and pregnancy. Pathological causes commonly, what we, clinically we found is the fever is the most commonest. Uh, cause of the uh, sinus tachycardia. Anemia is also thyrotoxicosis, hypovolemia, certain drugs. In case of antihypertensive, the amlodipine sometimes associated with uh, this sinus tachycardia. And salbutamol, commonly used in, in form of nebulizations or in case of oral form or inhaler form. Atrophine, uh, sometimes used uh, as to, to increase the rate of the heart in case of uh, where the heart rate is significantly reduced. So these are the drugs uh, causing the increase. Rate. Simultaneously, the thyroxine. When there is increased amount of thyroxine in the blood, there will be increased heart rate. So just look at this issue, what we are finding. <coughs> The rate is, uh, I mean, the 
if you look at the lead two, uh, there is a P OIB is fine, PR interval is normal, QRS complex is normal, T OIB is also is normal. But the interval between the RR interval is very big in the distance. So rate is significantly reduced. Uh, I mean, this is a case of sinus bradycardia. So when there is bradycardia, we find at least few causes uh, in, this. in case of uh, certain, um, especially in physiological cause into the athletes, because the athletes uh, are going for running and exercising and the heart beats uh, initially uh, gradually increases while they are going for exercise. But each time it becomes normal due to the upper hand activities of the uh, vagus nerve. So vagus uh, has taken over the, uh, I mean, the driving force uh, as a driving nervous system in case of athletes. So in when uh, in a athletes who is uh, used to take exercise regularly, every time the vagus nerves uh, dominates to make the heart rate normal and finally settle down to the uh, normally the person have got, has got the bradycardia. And we know the other causes also during deep sleeps and especially the clinical situations where we, we used to got these sorts of uh, re reduced rate. I mean, the bradycardia is the commonest uh, happening in our country and all over the world, it is the hypothyroidism. And hypothermia, not that much commonly encountered. But when uh, uh, patients having a severe headache, vomiting, uh, the features of the raised intracranial pressure due to the ixol, and if we found the bradycardia, it means the ICP, I mean the raised intracranial pressure is huge. So when the intracranial pressure is very much raised, the presence of the bradycardia is means the ominous sign. And this is found, in, I mean the bradycardia in case of raised ICP is one of the important finding. And certain drugs commonly used, the beta blockers is very much commonly used. And also sometimes we use the digoxin and verapramil to reduce the heart rate also. And in case of acute myocardial infection, we all know it is associated with the bradycardia because sometimes the uh, uh, SNO and the uh, other conduction system may be involved in case of uh, inferior myocardial infection. So uh, just look at this ECG, uh, what is uh, seen? Uh, what I have requested everyone to start from the, again, from the, uh, to look at the complexes, whether this is normally appearance or not at a glance, then look at the rate and then uh, whether, uh, what about the rhythm? <laughs> Just at a glance, we are uh, finding the QRS complexes in every leads is not the same. Just uh, what we have found in the previous ECG, it was always the normal complexes, but here the complex is a bit wider. And if we look at the two, and uh, ABL3, sorry, three, and ABF, the uh, ST segment is significantly elevated and uh, the rhythm is normal. And rate is also within the normal limit. So here the very much finding is the ST segment elevation in uh, about the two, uh, three ABF, uh, if there is ST segment elevation. To some extent elevation also B6 and B4 probably. And there is reciprocal ST depression in case of V2 and V4. So uh, what I've uh, seen in, uh, in the ECG uh, is the ST segment elevations in the lead 2, 3, and ABF. D inversion in the lead 2, 3, ABF. And pathological QF in the lead uh, 3 and ABF. Rhythm is regular, heart rate is 60 bit per minute. Diagnosis means the acute inferior ST elevated myocardial infection. Probably we should also uh, omit the involvement of the B6 and B4. So this is not only acute, but there is extension in the lateral part also. Uh, if we look at this ECG, the same thing is here. Uh, the changes uh, from B1 to B6, there is extensive involvement in the chest leads, I mean the ST elevations, and there is, depending of the, I mean the Q wave is also there. So it means the acute ST is significantly elevated and associated with the Q wave means the throw and throw involvement, whole thickness of the myocardium is involvement. And the anatomical distributions, what we have learned from the previous slides, 
is in the uh, I mean the anterior chest wall. anterior uh, wall of the heart is involved so this is uh, also an acute anterior ST elevated myocardial infractions and just looking at the ECG we can assess uh, and the presence of the ST elevations it means in the acute uh, ST elevations and uh, the uh, Presence of the QF indicates means the whole thickness of the microdome is involved. We, we all know the, I mean, the non ST elevations, microdome infection sometimes is there, just the symmetrical TOF inversion sometimes we found. So, this is also an ECG. Uh, we are finding the rate is all right. QRS complex has got some abnormality. I mean, the ST elevations in case of uh, in V1, V2, V3. B5, B6, and there is uh, also significant, uh, uh, that is very uh, long QOF uh, in two, uh, in three and AVF. It means uh, presence of the QOF means the, I mean, uh, old, only the presence of the QOF means the old uh, infraction. So here there is acute infraction in case of B4, B5, B6, I mean the B1 to B6 anterior aspect. But 3 and ABF means the inferior uh, old microdial infraction. There is combination of the old infraction and also the recent microdial infractions. And there is sinus tachycardia also. So, uh, what are the questions can be asked in the looking at this ECG? The examiner can ask about the what is the sign symptoms of how this patient could present. Usually, the patient presented the severe central chest pain. One of the important cause of severe central chest pain is myocardial infractions. If some examiner just say, "I I know nothing uh, other than the myocardial infraction, the cause of the central compressive chest pain," he will pass in the exam. And there are also other causes also like the tension pneumothorax, like massive pulmonary embolism, uh, and also the uh, uh, tearing of the aneurysm, aortic aneurysm. And uh, other questions may be asked, what are the other associated symptoms can happen? These are the like the shortness of breath, vomiting, and sweating. Could all the patients with presence with the chest pain always? There are some atypical presentation in certain patients maybe there is a painless myocardial infection, especially patients with autonomic neuropathy having the long-standing diabetes mellitus with complications. And also it's in a very elderly patients may not be aware of the chest pain, but uh, this is, uh, this patient suffers from the painless myocardial infections. Then the, what are the other diagnostic facility tools, uh, diagnostic tests can be done. And this is the uh, troponin, uh, is one of the commonest investigation nowadays uh, we do. And there are other also enzymes also, and echocardiography can sometimes help, and associated investigations, uh, essential investigations where facilities are available, coronary angiogram may be done. But interesting is that typical uh, chest pain, typical pictures of the sign sin symptoms of myocardial infarction may not be associated with the ECG change. We should know, because in the very first few minutes, the ECG change uh, may not be uh, may not appear, and it takes sometimes uh, one or two hours even. And but uh, we should go for in these cases we should go for the serial ECGs, and uh, we should we can depend on the troponin and other enzymes. Uh, regarding the treatment, we all know how many treatment where facilities is available. All should be in the care, uh, coronary care units. But uh, the very onset, we should uh, uh, give the patients uh, tablets, a uh, few tablets of aspirin, copidogrel, or we can use uh, the morphine and other things. And regarding the treatment, one important thing is uh, depends on the duration, and especially in case of ST elevated myocardial infraction, we all know the where facilities available, PCI is done. So, percutaneous intervention to for the uh, that is uh, going is now it is performed if the patients usually comes within two hours. Uh, the prognosis is excellent and where facilities is available for the reperfusions. And even if it is late, uh, somebody uh, some uh, somewhere it is says it can be done within 12 hours, even uh, some can perform. Uh, 
within 24 hours even then the patient might be benefited other uh, important uh, drugs can be commonly used for the uh, refurbishment is the streptokinase lt-plase and other new model so, uh, drugs can be used so we know all the complications of the acute complications and delayed complications in case of migraine. Commonest complication is the arrhythmia, we all know. The uh, important complications are severe complications like the uh, VT, PF, and very big complications like the AB block and uh, atrial fibrillations. And one of the important complications is the acute heart failure. And sometimes the rupture of the papillary uh, muscles. We all know the ventricular aneurysm. If there is ventricular aneurysm, in these cases, the ST elevation is persistent. So persistence of the ST elevations, even the disappearance of the or the patients become all right, but the ST elevation persistent means the ventricular aneurysm. And other causes of ST elevations with concavity upwards is in case of uh, pericarditis. So just uh, looking at this ECG, here again, uh, the rate is a bit uh, complex, is almost normal. P wave is, uh, we can see the P wave, and T wave inversion uh, is there. Mm. And the we, if we look at this, the in one, uh, lead one, the there is significant height of the, I mean, the QRS, uh, complexes RAB is uh, height is increased and similarly in case of B5 and B6 and in ABL also uh, the in ABL uh, it's not significantly uh, the height is not significant uh, there but if we uh, count down the summation of the B5 and the uh, I mean the uh, B5 and uh, B1 and uh, S in B1 and B5, the it is total, the uh, I, I mean, the total amount is more than uh, 35 millimeter, means the left ventricular hypertrophy. So here, uh, what is the underlying cause of that very hypertrophy? Uh, because the patient has got the uh, bradycardia and simultaneously evidence of the hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy. So other criteria, the single criteria, sometimes the it, if the AVL, the R wave is more than 11 millimeter, this is the single criteria to say that, uh, I mean, that there is hypertrophy, ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, by looking at the ECG, sometimes we can assess the cause of the hypertrophy. Probably in this patient, patient may have some uh, drugs uh, causing the bradycardia and the cause uh, where there is commonest cause in our country of left ventricular hypertrophy is the systemic hypertension. This is not only in our country, all over the world. So uh, I have mentioned the uh, ECG findings. The R in V6 is 30 millimeter and S uh, in V1, 18 millimeter. This, this is definitely more than 35. And left ventricular hypertrophy with strain because the TOF is inverted and there is asymmetrical. The two limbs of the TOF uh, is asymmetrical, not the symmetrical. When there is asymmetrical TOI inversions uh, with the features of uh, hypertrophy, this is due to the uh, ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern, we used to call it. And uh, the cause of, again, I have mentioned, the commonest cause of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy is the systemic hypertension. And the association of bradycardia, we can say probably this is the case of hypertension and the patient is having the beta blocker or certain calcium channel blocker like the diltiazine and causing the bradycardia. So uh, uh, some questions may be asked, what will be the clinical findings in uh, just looking at the uh, ECG? But the other clinical findings may help to say the patient has got the evidence of the uh, the patient has got the evidence of the ventricular hypertrophy. Definitely, the apex beat uh, will be the forceful or the shifted uh, outwards and downwards. And if the patient has got just heaving apical impulse, uh, having no murmur, it means the hypertension. If the patient has got the heaving apical impulse with evidence of the murmur, uh, I mean the ejection systolic murmur, the underlying cause is the aortic stenosis. If the patient has got the forceful apex beat, uh, having this source of ECG and the apex bit is forceful, I mean the thrusting, 
and there is evidence of the early diastolic murmurs because is the aortic regurgitation. So just looking at the ECG and also the clinical findings, if we correlate, we can diagnose almost most of the uh, pathology underlying cause. And then the other investigations can help us, the, like the echocardiography. And I have uh, mentioned already the commonest causes like the aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, and the most commonest cause is the systemic hypertension uh, of the left ventricular hypertrophy and other causes including the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also. So if we, uh, what we are finding in this city, uh, again, the rate is almost within normal limit probably. Uh, and there is T inversion, asymmetrical T inversion in B1, uh, B2. There is also ST depression also. But uh, uh, the, B1 uh, is the height of the RA is very, very uh, significant. And uh, the uh, height, uh, when in case of right ventricular hypertrophy, the ECG criteria is when the height of the RA is more than six millimeter in the B1, it means the patient with the right ventricular hypertrophy. Or the R and the S wave ratio is more than one, is uh, that is, uh, in brief, we can say the patient has got the right ventricular hypertrophy. Here, the patient has got the criteria of the uh, right ventricular hypertrophy with uh, the asymmetrical UIB, I mean the strain pattern. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the ECG showing the right ventricular hypertrophy. And if we uh, ask uh, the student, I was, sometimes uh, our teachers will ask, what are the typical evidence of the right ventricular hypertrophy? Sometimes the apex bead is shifted outwards, may not be in the downwards, uh, but the Characteristic findings is the in palpation is the uh, I mean the left personal lip. When there is evidence of the left personal lip, uh, it means the right ventricular hypertrophy. And if we go for the ECG, uh, we expect this sort of finding. But just we have seen the ECG previously. So what are the commonest causes of the right ventricular hypertrophy? Uh, the students may be uh, encountered from the teachers' questions. And this is the commonest cause. Uh, again, the right ventricular hypertrophy is the pulmonary hypertension, whether it is primary or secondary. In our day-to-day -day practice, we used to encounter the commonest causes of uh, secondary pulmonary hypertension is the lung pathology. And COPD is one of the important findings. So a patient's having COPD with the evidence of the right ventricular hypertrophy, we clinically we say this is a case of core pulmonary. And the very much cause is usually the core pulmonary. And the underlying cause, lung pathology, may be other than this, like the DPLD and other things also. And there are other valvular uh, conditions may be associated. Say patients has got the pulmonary stenosis. We, we used to find some systolic uh, murmur in the uh, pulmonary area. And on palpation, there might be associated with the three. And the right ventricular hypertrophy, soft uh, second component of the heart sound. Everything will uh, goes in favor of the right ventricular hypertrophy due to pulmonary stenosis. Say in case of mitral stenosis, uh, what can happen? In case of mitral stenosis, we know the patients have the tapping apical impulse. There is uh, uh, increased amount as there is a left atrial pressure increase. Uh, retrograde uh, in a retrograde manner, there is uh, pulmonary hypertension is also increased. And this uh, causes the, I mean, the outflow. Of, I mean, the right ventricular uh, has to face the more pressure in the pulmonary circulation. And uh, secondarily, there is pulmonary uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. So in case of mitral stenosis or certain other valvular disease to the mitral regurgitation, there might be associated uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. So again, uh, what just I have mentioned, the left personal leave uh, or heap is a characteristic findings of the almost uh, sometimes hallmark for the diagnosis to say that the patient has got the, uh, I mean, right ventricular hypertrophy. And sometimes pulse epig uh, epigastric pulsation is also help in diagnosing, uh, in uh, I'm mean, correlating the diagnosis of the right ventricular hypertrophy. And presence of marmar on auscultations means the valvular uh, involvement, what I mentioned previously. And other investigations like, uh, echocardiography uh, can help us uh, 
to say definitely what is the underlying lesion. Uh, commonest causes is the pulmonary hypertension I have mentioned, uh, the primary or, or uh, secondary, and sometimes ventricular septal defect or atrial septal defect associated with the right ventricular hypertrophy while there is partial of the shunt. In this case, the patient is uh, uh, associated with the central cyanosis. Then we can call it the Eisenmenger syndrome. So uh, in the very beginning, we have seen when uh, just at a glance, we have to look at the uh, complexes, QRS complexes. Here we are finding that there is big complexes, white QRS complexes. So the white QRS complexes, the height of the RA uh, in, in one avial is positive deflections, but significant air so in the V6 and V5. This means the left uh, ventricular LBB, left bundle runs block. So uh, this is the case of left bundle runs blocks block. And this is sometimes encountered. And when they're in ECG, while we are finding the evidence of the left bundle branch block, it means all is pathological. All is pathological. The underlying cause must be there. It can be associated in case of systemic hypertension. It can be associated with aortic stenosis. It can be associated with uh, like the, uh, I mean, cardiomyopathy or ischemic, uh, ischemic heart diseases. So uh, commonest cause is the acute myocardial infractions or other coronary artery diseases, severe coronary artery diseases, the aortic stenosis I have mentioned, cardiomyopathy, and long-standing hypertension, I mean, systemic hypertension. And treatment accordingly. Uh, RSR pattern in the V1, we are seeing here also, uh, I mean, S wave in the uh, lead one, but the uh, M pattern complex, the RSR wave, uh, that QRS complex in the V1 uh, means the patient has got the right ventricular hypertrophy. I mean, the uh, right bundle block. So uh, this is a uh, this is an ECG of the right bundle block. And right bundle branch block is not always pathological. Sometimes it is congenital or familial. And uh, the other causes of right bundle branch blocks, again, the ischemic heart diseases, uh, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, and uh, maybe associated with the uh, hypertension, probably pulmonary hypertension. So what we are uh, finding uh, from the very beginning, we uh, we have uh, seen that what is the POA? Is it normal? What is the PR interval? Is it within the 0.12 second? Uh, what about the ST segment? We have we have encountered the ST segment abnormalities. We have encountered the uh, I mean the QS complex abnormality, like the white QS complex. Uh, here we are. If we look carefully, the PR interval is more than uh, 0.12 second. So there is prolongation of the PR interval. So PR interval is prolonged. Uh, means it takes time from the atria to ventricle. Uh, so uh, there is prolonged PR interval, uh, and the rhythm is sinus. Definitely, the, this is the first degree heart block. We know there are first degree heart block, second degree heart block, and third degree or complete heart block. The commonest cause is the drug or is one of the important cause of the prolonged PR interval. And myocardial infraction, I think the second important or the first uh, first or second drugs and myocardial infraction, almost the similar, uh, I mean the same uh, ranking in causing the uh, first degree heart block in the prolonged PR interval. Rheumatic, uh, rheumatic cardiac is also important, but nowadays we usually encounter very less number of the cases of the rheumatic carditis. So uh, usually the FDP OF is uh, accompanied by a QRS complex. This is the normal uh, findings. But when there is a P, uh, one of, or two P OF is not associated uh, with uh, QRS complex, it means there is some sort of block. I mean, the POF cannot enter into the uh, ventricle. So it cannot generate the QRS complex. There is some sort of block. 
So uh, in case of first degree heart block, we have seen the peer interval is prolonged. Here, there are certain POFs. It's not accompanied by POFs. There is some dropping or missing of the uh, QRS complexes. So there is uh, here we are also uh, finding some sorts of uh, heart block. This is called the second degree heart block. And uh, this is uh, probably Mobis type 2. I mean, the, this is the second degree heart block. So um, here uh, the uh, we have uh, find the uh, second degree heart, uh, heavy block. Just uh, look at this uh, ECG. What we are finding here: the relationship of the PO uh, the PR interval uh, is always uh, some most of the time it is static, but while there is PR interval is not, uh, I mean, the, uh, always in the same manner. I mean, uh, there is uh, the PR interval is variable PR interval. Then uh, we, say, we can say there is some source of, uh, I mean, some source of block is there. And in this case, the RR interval is all right. And PP interval is all right. So. Uh, uh, where there is uh, heavy dissociations, there is P is uh, running in its own way and R is running in its own, own, own way, then there is dissociations and uh, the uh, PR interval is variable, then we call it the complete heart block. Here the rate is 55. Usually in case of a complete heart block, uh, the rate is always less than 60. And in case of complete heart block, uh and if it is not congenital the rate is in around 40 45 and uh, not more than 50. as there is 55 it may be due to the congenital uh, complete heart block or uh, other causes but, uh, most of the co uh, complete heart block the heart rate is usually in and around 40 or 45. so how a patient with a complete heart block presents Sometimes the patients uh, remain asymptomatic, and sometimes the only the uh, features of palpitations. How, of, as the rate is minimum, but the stroke volume is very high because the heart get enough time to be fulfilled. Then the uh, we call it the bradycardia. I mean, the due to bradycardia, there is enough time to be filled. So, and diastolic volume is very high, and the stroke volume is high. So the palpitation, the patient feels there is a throbbing. I mean the thrusting of the heartbeat and patients sometimes complain complain about the palpitations and the stroke adam syndrome means syncopal attack in case of complete heart block this is one of the commonest uh, findings in uh, on the presentations of complete heart block and again the commonest cause is the myocardial infarction is the commonest cause and the others are causes of certain uh, drugs like digoxin beta blocker can be associated with the complete heart block and i have mentioned the uh, congenital heart block. In case of myocardial infarction, it may be the transient uh, complete heart block. It may be eliminated. And uh, in other, if it persists, when there is persistent complete heart block, the treatment is the permanent pacemaker. So uh, we have uh, mentioned the uh, most of the cases we used to encounter the in exam the acute myocardial infractions and complete heart block. Uh, and sometimes the uh, abnormalities of the rate, I mean the sinus tachycardia, sometimes the bradycardia. And here we are finding about the abnormality of the rhythm. If you look at the ECG, the, uh, if you look for the POF, in most of the leads, there is no POF. And some sorts of replacement of the POF by fibrillatory oil, I mean the FOF. And some ECG may not be, uh, FOF may be absent. But the characteristic findings is the irregular RR intervals. So when POF is absent and it is replaced by fibrillatory OF, and the RR interval is uh, irregularly irregular, but the shape of the complex is normal, the diagnosis is atrial fibrillations. And we all know the causes of the atrial fibrillations. We all know the complications of the atrial fibrillations. So uh, in the exam, uh, uh, the teachers can ask about uh, the causes of the atrial fibrillations. 
the commonest cardiac cause is the mitral valvular disease and especially the mitral stenosis and of course mitral regurgitation may be associated with the atrial fibrillations and non-cardiac cause, commonest cause is the thyrotoxicosis, we all know. And sometimes the respiratory conditions, pneumonia and other things may be associated with the atrial fibrillation, cardiomyopathy. And uh, one of the important cause is always is uh, microbial infractions or ischemic heart diseases uh, are the causes. And some sometimes we don't get any other causes, then it is called it the lone atrial fibrillations. Sometimes alcoholism, sometimes ASD, may be associated with atrial fibrillations. So all, uh, almost we have uh, mentioned all the causes and the commonest complications or dangerous complications of atrial fibrillations is the thromboembolism and the heart failure. And the uh, management of, I mean, the presentations may be heart failure may be associated with the, uh, I mean, patients sometimes uh, cardio, I mean, the, become unstable in terms of uh, hemody hemodynamically unstable. Pulse blood pressure may not be record recordable when atrial fibrillation is associated with the very fast ventricular rate. And uh, then the patients uh, comes with the features of the shock. And then we have to manage the attack. I mean, the patients have to stabilize by reducing the uh, conversion in the sinus rhythm and reducing the rate by DC shock, by giving certain drugs like amiodarone, uh, like injection flicanide and baraflamin, uh -huh. even the injectable uh, form of, uh, I mean, the IV form of beta blocker can be given to reduce the heart rate. And sometimes the decoxins is also given. So control of the, uh, I mean, the rate control and the rhythm control, I mean, the conversion to sinus rhythm is one of the important things. And uh, to treat the underlying cause is the permanent solutions to maintain a sinus rhythm. And to prevention of the thromboembolism in case of, because the effective heart atrial beating is not there in case of atrial fibrillations. And that's why the movement, as there is no effective contraction in the uh, atrium. So atria, uh, the, there is chance to have uh, accommodations of the patriots and other things, and there is thrombus formation, which will disclose while they become, uh, comes into sinus rhythm or, or some parts of the cardiac events. There is disclosement of the thrombus happening with the thromboembolism. So to prevent the happening of the thromboembolic phenomena, uh, in case of chronic atrial fibrillations, the very much drug we should use is the anticoagulant. The commonest one is the warfarin. And nowadays, we can uh, also use the directly acting oral anticoagulants. Here, the uh, normality is that in, in case, if we look at the, uh, I mean, lead one, uh, the rate is, I mean, the very, um, uh, I mean, significant bradycardia is there. POF is not visible. And same uh, in case of, to see the POF, the, the most important leads are the lead two and the B1. And if we look at the B1 and uh, two, is there is, P, typical POF is not there. So it is replaced by sawtooth appearance OF. So when there is sawtooth appearance of the, uh, I mean, POF, uh, or POF like, then we call it the uh, atrial flutter. So atrial flutter is another, uh, I mean, atrial, uh, I mean, atrial arrhythmia uh, may be associated uh, with maybe very fast ventricular rate or bradycardia while there is atrial flutter associated with certain block. This may be the uh, second degree, third degree or fourth degree heart block. And the cause, again, the ischemic heart disease and the cause may be the uh, respiratory cause or sometimes associated with the valvular diseases. So the cause of the irregularly irregular heartbeat is the cause is atrial fibrillation. Number one is atrial fibrillation. Number two is atrial fibrillation. Number three is atrial fibrillation. But sometimes atrial flutter associated with vari variable block is uh, uh, maybe uh, show the evidence of the irregular irregular pulses. And ventricular ectopics with multifocal ventricular, ventricular ectopics so also associated the irregular, irregular, irregular heartbeat. So what is uh, 
finding what we are finding in this city the rate is very fast and the complex is rather narrow and but the similarity of the complexes uh, i mean the, there is no abnormality in the complexes but the rate is very fast so somewhere there is a uh, st depression uh, which is maybe so the rate related so the typical finding in this is the very much uh, is the rate is very high almost uh, it is more than 150 so when there is this sorts of uh, rate is more than 150 and the regular uh, rr interval the probabilities of the supraventricular tachycardia we should think and how this patient presents and uh, this patients also present with the palpitations features of shock i mean the hemodynamically unstable maybe there by a patient may present uh, with the uh, I mean, non-recordable pulse and blood pressure. And the patient should be managed immediately during the attack. Uh, we can go for the carotid massages or valsalva maneuver. And if hemodynamically unstable, we can go for the DC shock event. And uh, subsequently, uh, we can go for the IV adenosine and other IV drugs. So in case of supraventricular tachycardia, the commonest cause is uh, is uh, sometimes as with the thyrotoxicosis, ischemic heart diseases, and uh, sometimes the uh, aberrant AV conductions, WBW syndrome. So these are the causes of supraventricular tachycardia. And sometimes there is no cause is found. So idiopathic uh, cause may be there. And uh, the treatment is depends on the during attack and the prevention of the attack, because it can happen in the paroxysmal manner. So treatment during attack and to prevention of the uh, repeated attack, we should treat the underlying cause. So anxiety, tension, tea, coffee, but sometimes as well as the physiological cause, pathological, I have mentioned the thyroxicosis, ischemic heart disease, WBW syndrome, uh, very rarely the digital is toxicity. So uh, first of all, we should assure the patients if there is no hemodynamic instability. Uh, I have mentioned there about the carrot man management uh, almost. And when there is aberrant conduction pathway uh, with the recurrent uh, attack of the supraventricular tachycardia, I mean the WPW syndrome, the treatment is uh, catheter ablation, radio frequency ablations. So here uh, we are finding the different complexes. Uh, one is a bizarre complex uh, with very wide QRS complex with T inversion. Another uh, is a normal complex. Uh, uh, the height is not that much. Typical uh, normal appearance in between. And every normal beat, a normal complex is uh, followed by an abnormal complex white. Thing. So this is the premature ventricular contractions. Uh, this may be a normally findings in the healthy person sometimes and uh, there is no underlying cause and sometimes the uh, other causes like the ischemia or uh, the cardiomyopathy or other valvular lesions may be associated with the ventricular ectopics so these are the other ectopics sometimes uh, found in couple couplet or sometimes triplet when there is uh, three uh, ventricular ectopics occurs to get together we then uh, call it the particular tachycardia. Uh, if we look at this ECG, but the abnormal very much abnormality is uh, just the tall peak T wave in the chest lips and also in the lead two. So when there is tall peak T wave, T wave height of the T wave is more than ten, and then we should think of uh, several causes. The most important thing is the potassium. Just we if we put the potassium below the underneath the T wave. When there is elevated, TOF is also elevated. In, it means hyperkalemia is the important cause of the tall peak T. The only cause maybe we can uh, memorize. And so when there is tall peak T, uh, we should think of or we should be cautious about the possibilities of the hyperkalemia. And we should measure the potassium level and should take the actions accordingly, according to the level of the potassium. And because uh, this may turn into ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillations threaten the life of the patients. And the we know the underlying cause of the, the commonest cause is the acute renal failure, the cause of the hyperkalemia. And certain drugs may be associated. Sometimes we use the ST inhibitors in case of, uh, I mean, the heart failure patients. And sometimes combinedly, ST inhibitors and spironolactone used together. So the 
every time we should be careful about looking at the potassium level because both these drugs can be associated with the hyperkalemia and patient may mm, present with this source of ECG and sometimes maybe ominous uh, fatality may happen due to the ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillations. And we all know the management of hyperkalemia, which is in, invariably uh, encountered in written exam and also in the buyback exam, how we should manage the uh, cases of hyperkalemia. The most important drug is the IV uh, calcium gluconate and uh, IV glucose uh, with insulin or without insulin and IV sodium bicarbonate. But commonly nowadays, we used to found everywhere the uh, sal inhaled sal salbutamol or the nebulizer salbutamol can be given easily. And uh, dialysis is the last resort of treatment. So what we are looking at this is the, uh, I mean, the bradycardia is there. Uh, TOF uh, is, uh, we can look at the POF, but TOF is not that much visible or it become flat. So uh, in the previous ECG, we have found when we put the potassium, uh, potassium elevated, TOF is elevated. And we can think the as TOF is flat means the potassium uh, is diminished. So hypokalemia is one of the important cause of flat T or T inversion sometimes. And there are other causes also. Ischemia may happen with this flattening of the TOF or T inversion. So this is a typical ECG of the hypokalemia. And hypokalemia, uh, we know the causes of the hypokalemia and how to manage hypokalemia we should uh, uh, think about the management and we should memorize the uh, management of the hypokalemia. Uh, but be careful about uh, introducing the potassium. Uh, when injectable potassium is given, it should be always mixed with the normal saline. And a uh, few days back, I have found one patient having hypertension, very young patients. And uh, uh, when I suggest the patients for uh, electrolytes, and I have found the uh, potassium level is diminished 1.2 uh, and the, there is significant changes in the ECG I mean the TOI is flattened rather it was in, inverted so hypertension with hypokalemia uh, uh, and ECG changes and finally I suggested the patients uh, for ultrasonography and I found uh, in the adrenal gland there is a tumor and this is nothing but the cone syndrome and uh, the patient is now managing conservatively and is getting prepared for the surgery. And we have consulted with the uh, urolo urologist for surgery. So hypokalemia is the commonest cause. We know the diarrhea, vomiting, and sometimes usage of the diuretics as an antihypertensive or in case of heart failures, uh, invariably associated with the hypokalemia. So some other rare causes are the renal tubular acidosis. So here the com there is rate is very much increased. The complex is very much white, and this is a typical and um, typical ECG uh, of a white complex tachycardia. The commonest cause is the ventricular tachycardia. The underlying cause again the myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease. There certain drugs and uh, certain other conditions uh, may be associated with. Uh, like the electric imbalance, cardiomyopathy may be associated with ventricular tachycardia. And hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, uh, sometimes there is no cause is found. So the one important cause of ventricular tachycardia is the acute myocardial infections or myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, and certain electrolyte imbalance. So while the ventricular tachycardia becomes symptomatic associated with the hemodynamically unstable patients, I mean, the uh, patient is in shock, blood pressure, and uh, pulse is not trackable. We should go for the DC cardio version. And amidaron is also a very good drug. So this is an ECG of bizarre complexes uh, in a twisted manner. So this is a case of uh, ventricular tachycardia uh, in a twisted manner, bizarre complexes, multi-morphic. Uh, a ventricular tachycardia. This is torsed D point is. And uh, finally, these patients, uh, this source of bigger complexes, maybe uh, we call it the ventricular fibrillations. 
and this is one of the important cause of uh, I mean the uh, cardiac arrest. So in case of ventricular uh, tachycardia, the complexes are similar almost. Uh, and in case of ventricular fibrillation, it is bizarre complexes. And this is one of the important cause of, I mean, the uh, cardiac arrest. And we all know the management of the cardiac arrest. And we should know this. <clears throat> Again, the causes of uh, ventricular fibrillations, uh, the acute myocardial infections, electrocutions, drug overdose, and treatment, of course, the immediate defibrillations. So this is all about um, my talk today. And sorry, I have taken enough time, uh, probably. And uh, sorry for uh, being late and taking enough time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for your amazing presentation. Now it's time for the question and answer session. These are the questions that you ask in the comment section during the live session. I sincerely apologize first because we won't be able to answer all the questions because the time is short. But we will try to answer as much as possible. So without doing any delay, let me hand over the question and answer session to Dr. Madhubi Karmakar Madam. Dr. Madhubi Karmakar Madam. Well, uh, first I would like to thank our honorable speaker for his wonderful presentation in a very simple way. Hope it will help all the students to make their concept clear and will alleviate all the fear about the CG. We have few questions uh, in our hand. So on behalf of the students, I'm going to ask to our honorable speaker. Uh, first question asked by Sabrina Yusuf. She wanted to know how to differentiate sinus tachycardia and SVT in ECG. Uh, well, uh, very nice questions. And I'd like to thank uh, her for uh, asking such a nice questions. Uh, usually in case of sinus tachycardia, the QRS complex, PR interval, everything is within normal limit. And all the segments are within normal limit, but the rate is more than 100. And it is not the associated with the small QRS complexes, and rate usually does not exceed the 150. So when there is the rate is more than 150 and above, and the QRS complex is smaller and regular, uh, then we it, we it seems or we call it the uh, supraventricular tachycardia. And Thank of you, course, sir, uh, the sign symptoms sign symptoms also help us. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, another question, it is asked, uh, how to differentiate tall peak T wave due to hyperkalemia or hyperacute myocardial infarction? Is there any criteria? Uh, yes, uh, tall peak, when the, it is called the tall peak, uh, the, it is uh, always peak and uh, there is sudden rise and the, both the limbs are sudden uh, descent. Uh, the white of the uh, I mean the tall peak, in case of tall peak due to hyperkalemia, the white is not more than usually the five millimeter or usually less than five millimeter. But in case of hyperacute microne infraction, it is tall but wider. And uh, uh, so far uh, I can uh, recollect it is more than uh, five millimeter or, or like this. So in case of tall peak means it is hyperkalemia. It is always peak, but the base is network. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question, Afsana Rahman wanted to know, can anterior myocardial infarction and inferior myocardial infarction occur at the same time? Yes, this can happen. Uh, of course, uh, can happen uh, simultaneously. Uh, well, sir, another related this question. In my involvement of the artery, yes. Yes, sir. And there is another related question that in that case, when there is anterior inferior MI, uh, how to differentiate pericarditis and anterior inferior myocardial infarction? Uh, in case of pericarditis, uh, I mean, the uh, typical uh, chest pain, uh, characteristic chest pain is not there in case of uh, pericarditis. This is one clinically. 
and also pericarditis by auscultation we used to get the evidence of the pericarditis in case of isolated pericarditis are uh, not associated with the myocardial infarctions but in case of inferior myocardial infarctions the typical st elevations uh, in case of st elevated myocardial infarctions but in case of pericarditis the st elevation is there but concavity upward this is the typical appearance. Of course, history, other clinical examinations uh, will help us to differentiate. And also the biochemical investigations also help us. And definitely the echocardiography also help us. But by looking at the ECG, the typical appearance of the ST elevations is helpful. Thank you, sir. Uh, so another question, Surya Parvin. It, it is, it is, in case of pericarditis, it involves almost the most of the leads. But in case of uh, inferior myocardial infarction, definitely lead to three ABF. Yes, sir. Uh, Suraya Parvin wanted to know uh, what will be the differentiating point between dextrocardia and technical lead placement error. Um, of course, uh, this is. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the technical, uh, probably the pitch of change in the lead one and the B1 is the typical uh, uh, appearance in case of true dextrocardia. But TOF, uh, POF, POF changes in the other leads uh, uh, generally uh, occur so far, man, I can uh, say. Uh, probably Nazmul Hassan sir can uh, say uh, details about the in case of technical, uh, my, uh, I mean, uh, dextrocardia. Probably the POF inverted in all the leads, probably. Uh, well, uh, sir, another question. Uh, Suraya Parvin uh, again asked, when there is tachyarrhythmia, what will, how they can differentiate atrial fibrillation from atrial flutter? When there is tachyarrhythmia, at, how, how could we differentiate? Uh, how, yes, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, how can we differentiate it? Uh, in case of tachyarrhythmia, yes, uh, uh, the atrial, just looking at the POA, uh, in case of POA, uh, the uh, POA is absent and it is replaced by fibrillatory OA in case of atrial fibrillations. But when it is sore tooth appearance, then it is atrial flutter usually. And sometimes coarse atrial fibrillations, I should not say here, Post septal fibrillation mimic the appearance of the sore tooth appearance. So uh, this should not be mentioned over here. Just, but uh, we can say in case of atrial fibrillation, BOF is replaced by fibrillatory OF, uh, which is very much thin and uh, uh, frequency is very high. But sore tooth appearance and atrial flutter, one. Second importance is that usually atrial flutter, the heartbeat is regular. Uh, usually regular manner and if it is irregular regularly irregular but in case of atrial fibrillation it is irregularly irregular uh, but in case of atrial flutter usually say the there is atrial flutter is associated with certain degrees of block if it is one in all the leads there is two is to one more money uh, all the time it is three is to one block then the heart rate is regular but when it is variable block then it is uh, it look like the rr complex the r uh, the qrs com i mean the rr interval look like the atrial fibrillation uh, so uh, in case of in nutshell the p appearance of the pof and the uh, i mean the rr interval usually regular in case of atrial flutter but in case of atrial fibrillation it is typically irregularly regular. but rarely atrial flutter mimic the atrial fibrillation Sometimes it is difficult to differentiate. Thank you very much, sir, for your nice explanation. And this is the end of our question and answer session. Hope your explanation will help our students a lot. Now, I'd like to request our honorable panelist, Professor Mohd Hafiz Shardar, sir, to say something about our today's session and the topic. Sir, please. Is sir present here? Mm, sir, I said, ma'am. Office, sir. Ma'am, I guess Office, sir, is not present due to some network issue, ma'am. 
uh, well then we can proceed and when sir will be available we'll again uh, we can go back to sir uh, and uh, we are almost at the end of our session so i would like to request now our honorable chairperson professor okay Hafiz sir is uh, here. So may I now request Professor Hafiz Shardar sir to make some comments about our today's session and the topic. Thank you very much. I apologize for my poor connection. Yes. Uh, but uh, I was interrupted frequently. Uh, I am very honored as a participant in this important session. And I am very much honored in presence of our beloved mentor, Professor Nazmul Hassan sir, and our beloved teacher and uh, principal of Dhaka Medical College, especially Professor of Medicine. Uh, his nice pre presentation will elaborate the knowledge of myself also and the learner also. So I must thank uh, Professor Titu Mia from my heart for his nice, nice presentation. I also thanks to the organizers and the uh, participants in this session. Actually, ECG is very important for um, our practical life and in the, on, on also for in the exam. Uh, so from uh, the uh, perspective of exam, uh, this, this gives a very important impression to the examiner in the Viva Bussi. So uh, you should be you perform better in the exam. In the exam, you should uh, do the uh, interpretation of the X-ray very well. So uh, you can uh, impress the examiner initially. So uh, uh, and so, this is the learning of this is very important. And in this session, I think it will give a knowledge to you and also me. Uh, thanks the organizer for this uh, organize uh, for this. And I say to the learner that. But uh, you can identify the, any ECG at a glance. If you are not identified the ECG at a glance, you should ask, is it normal? Then uh, get the answer. Is it normal or abnormal? Is it abnormal? Then ask you question yourself, uh, what is the abnormality? Then uh, then see the rate, rhythm. Uh, well, we are almost at the end of our session. At this moment, I would like to request our honorable chairperson, <laughs> Professor A.J.N. Nasmul Ahsan, sir, to comment and to conclude the session. Thank you all and good luck for all the students. Professor Nasmul Ahsan, sir. Thank you, Dr. Madhavi. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I want to congratulate uh, Professor Titumia for his excellent deliberation on this topic. Uh, definitely, he is one of the most popular uh, teacher, popular physician of our country is popular due to different reasons. He is very academician, he is one of the most popular academician, he is a very good clinician. And whenever I requested to give a talk on this topic, immediately he agreed. It proves his commitment to a student and profession. We know at this moment, uh, fifth year students, final year students, they are preparing their, themselves for OSPI examination. Uh, we know there are eight topics and there are 10 stations. Uh, one is station, at least there will be some one ECG. There are some students, they find ECG is very difficult, but Professor Titumia, he has very nicely and very in a simple way, he has shown a lot of ECG and he has described in a very simple way. When we were a student, we also were afraid of ECG. Uh, we, I do not know why at that moment we were also afraid of ECG. But nowadays we think that it has become ECG. Possibly uh, teachers of present time, they try to make this ECG in simple, very simple way. Uh, he has also mentioned that if one doctor, one physician, knows how to read ECG. And I will add, not only ECG, if one physician or doctor can know how to read one X-ray and image, he is in a very advantageous position. So if you can take, you are able to take a very good 
history you can interpret the clinical science and if you can read the ecg and x-ray it is very easy to diagnose in most of the situation he has mentioned one example he found that the ecg was abnormal and he thought that possibly there is hypokalemia he has mentioned that he advised for serum electrolyte it was hypokalemia he then asked for ultrasonography and found there is adrenal tumor and the patient uh, was adrenal was done and the patient was so this is a way this is one of the example how one clinician starts from ecg and ultimately and the patient is diagnosed so to know ecg and x-ray and images this is very important for a doctor and for a physician i am uh, happy to see also professor s and hafiz i'm happy because i had an opportunity to work with professor titumia professor s and hafiz for almost for a decade we worked together in the medical college so it, it was uh, in my lifetime it was a very fortunate period i passed in the medical college and found that they are so brilliant so academicians so good clinicians so i requested them to come to this platform for students bangladesh society of medicine acp bangladesh chapter and they do regularly cme and seminars for doctors uh, but we also do some programs for residents but we think uh, medical students are most important target group in our our uh, profession so we have chosen that we have some responsibilities for uh, medical students so for for this time we have selected seven episodes on ospi i think it will cover almost all part next program will be on instruments and we have requested professor rubina yasmin she is also one of the important uh, and uh, very popular medicine specialist and teacher of our country uh, so uh, definitely uh, today's program was a very successful one uh, one some students they have asked very uh, important question this proves that it has this program has inspired them to learn it, how to differentiate uh, actual fever whether it is regular or irregular uh, how, how hyper acute uh, t wave can be differentiated from hyperkalemia or hyper acute mi and one student also asked how dextrocardia can be differentiated from dex technical dextrocardia so dextrocardia is a, a condition when the heart is remains on the right side so in lead one becomes lead three and lead three becomes lead one and avr is a lead in which all the you know, waves remains uh, inverted but in case of dextrocardia it becomes all the waves becomes positive uh, in case of two dextrocardia in d1 uh, there is right axis deviation that is uh, tall R wave. In V3, there is low voltage and, and gradually it becomes R becomes low. Um, but in case of technical dextrocardia, we get these changes in limb lifts, but in, we do not get in case of chest lift. So it is possible to differentiate that uh, true dextrocardia from technical dextrocardia. So this, I think today's program was a very successful one. I again uh, congratulate Professor Mount Titumia for his brilliant presentation and thankful on behalf of SAP Chapter and Malawi Society of Medicine and he is also one of the leaders of Society of Medicine and SAP Bangladesh Chapter. I am also thankful to SM Hafiz for giving the time. Thank you Dr. Madhavi and Dr. Prince they are also active members of SAP and Bangladesh Society of Medicine and Dr. Prince also our IT consultant. I hope all the listeners were very much benefited. And, and Professor Titumia has shown a good number of ECG. I think he has covered not only 
the syllabus of undergraduate. There is no syllabus, but um, the institute which is given in undergraduate examination, definitely the topics uh, will be covered. And also some postgraduate students will be also benefited from the presentation of Professor Titumi. I have also taken some time. Thank you, Professor Tevkamiya, Professor Hafiz, Dr. Madhavi, Dr. Pins, everyone. And I you, invite you to listen to our next topic. It will be on Thursday at 9 p.m. Professor Rubina Yasmin, she will be talking on instruments, which is given in OSPI. Uh, I invite you to attend that one. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank Sadly, you, Thank you we have come to the end of today's program. Thank you, Madhavi. As Thank always, you, we have learned so many important things from Sir today. I am sure after today's class, all the students will get maximum number in the ECG part of the OSPE examination, which will help soon. Many, many thanks to the speaker, the chair, the special guest, and last but not the least, the moderator, ma'am, for managing time for this program from their very busy schedule. I would like to thank all the audience who were with us throughout the event, especially those who asked very interesting questions. Hope you got your answer. If you joined late or couldn't see the program, then there is no need to be worried. You will find the whole program on the YouTube channel right after the live session finishes. Our next masterclass on OSPI will held on 11th of March where Professor Ruvina Yasmin Madam will discuss on instrument part of the OSPI examination. So see you all in the next episode. Until then, take care and good night.